Hello and welcome to the program. I'm your host, Neil Howard. Thank you for joining us today here on Health Professional Radio. Our guest today is Dr. Ellen Ritchie. She's Associate Professor of Clinical Medicine at Cornell Medical College with us today to talk about the rare type of blood cancer. Uh, welcome to Health Professional Radio, Dr. Ritchie. Thank you. If you could uh, give us a bit <laughs> of uh, background about yourself. Have you always been interested in rare blood diseases? Well, I've always been interested in blood diseases. Um, when I was a uh, training doctor, I really got interested in looking at blood under the microscope. It's actually extraordinarily beautiful. And that's what led me to become interested in blood disorders. And um, I like the complexity of patients who have myeloproliferative diseases. Okay. Now, Rare Disease Day is uh, coming up pretty fast. Uh, next week, February the, uh, the 28th, what exactly is a rare disease? Well, a rare disease is one that doesn't happen to a lot of people. Mm -hmm. um, polycythemia vera, the uh, prevalence of the disease in the United States is somewhere around 200,000. Okay. So it's a very few patients in the country altogether have the disease. And in fact, you could be diagnosed with this disease in some rural area uh, and not know anyone else your entire life that would have this disease. If it affects 200,000 people or less or maybe a little bit more, it's considered a rare disease. And I understand that there are just a few thousand diseases that can be considered rare, even though the people who are suffering from them, uh, it affects their life uh, quite deeply. That's correct. Mm -hmm. um, you know, anyone who has a disease, however rare it may be, is certainly affected by it uh, and certainly feels a need for treatment and a desire for treatment and a desire for people to take their disease seriously. Now, we're going to talk about this uh, PV. Talk about this, uh, this condition. Polycythemia vera is one of a small number of diseases that fall under the umbrella of a myeloproliferative neoplasm. Mm. And it really is a disease where you're making too many cells. You're making too many blood cells. Polycythemia vera in particular, you're often making too many red blood cells. Um, some of the other myeloproliferative diseases, you may be making too many platelets or too many white blood cells. And these cause problems, most notably um, a propensity to develop a blood clot. And all of our treatment for this disease is really aimed at lowering the risk of developing a blood clot over time. So too many uh, red blood cells as opposed to um, too many white blood cells that are fighting something. Why are, are we producing so many blood cells? What, what causes this type of disease? Well, there's usually a genetic reason why you start to make too many cells. Something gets turned on by your cells where you can't stop reproducing. Um, in polycythemia vera, they've actually identified a gene called JAK2, um, which has a mutation in it that often causes this disease, causes people to make too many red blood cells. It can also be seen in patients who make too many platelets, um, but this gene genetic abnormality doesn't know, it doesn't allow your cells to turn off when they need to. They just keep reproducing. Are there symptoms that um, mimic other diseases, other conditions? Well, um, one of the most common uh, symptoms is actually fatigue, which mm -hmm. I think all of us can ascribe that symptom to us for one reason or another on any given day of our lives. Mm -hmm. But fatigue, headaches, night sweats, uh, some patients develop total body itching, dizziness, all of these things are kind of nondescript symptoms that you could ascribe to something else, but they're associated with polycythemia vera. Um, patients can also develop uh, early satiety where they're not as hungry as they used to be and, and weight loss, which is unexplained. Um, these are, again, relatively nonspecific, and you don't have a hint that a patient might have this problem until they go to the doctor and get a, a blood count, which shows that the blood count is abnormal. Okay. At that point, most patients are sent to a hematologist. Okay. Now, at that point, once it's uh, diagnosed, if, if you catch it early, is the treatment option uh, a little less uh, rigorous or invasive as opposed to finding out years down the road? Um, well, you can have this disease and be alive with it for 20 years or more. Um, the most concerning aspect of the disease is developing a blood clot, and that's the most dramatic presentation of the disease. 
when someone comes in with a stroke or a heart attack or a blood clot um, in their lung or a blood clot elsewhere, which is an emergency type of symptom. This is the worst outcome for this disease, and it's a way that some patients can present. Certainly, we like to, to diagnose patients before something like this happens because the effects of a stroke or the effects of a heart attack are, are not necessarily reversible in any way. Right, so um, we really try and determine which patients may have the disease so we can prevent these bad things from happening. Symptoms that could be associated with anything, any number of things, can those symptoms persist for years and a person continually be misdiagnosed? They go in, as you say, for a stroke or a heart attack. Is there anything that can catch it early enough to um, stave off some of the, the effects of prolonged suffering? Well, it's really the blood count is very important because you usually see a marked elevation in red blood cells or platelets or white cells. There are many reasons why that can happen, but you want to look at the whole patient. And when you look at the whole patient and you determine that uh, they're having particular symptoms, that there's no infection or there's no uh, iron deficiency or other problem that's driving the abnormal blood counts, you have to look deeper and you need to do molecular testing and a bone marrow biopsy to see what the underlying problem might be. Hopefully, if you make a diagnosis of, myelo, of a myeloproliferative disorder, you can start to treat them. And the aim of that is really to reduce the risk of blood clot, but in doing so, you hope to really reduce the symptoms that a patient has. Overall, this is a slowly progressive disease over time, and the symptoms tend to get worse as the years go on. But we really try and treat patients in such a way to minimize these symptoms over time. Do you find uh, that symptoms present sometimes in younger patients as if they were on in years? Does is it ever get that severe in younger patients? Well, sometimes even children can be diagnosed with polycythemia vera, and occasionally uh, children are usually on the basis of having a nondescript symptom like a headache in a child which is persistent with an abnormal blood count. We see young people also who have these diseases. Um, I have a couple of patients who really presented uh, with many miscarriages, and there was an, a uh, uh, sort of a investigation as to why all these miscarriages had occurred, and they were found to have polycythemia vera. So there are many ways that patients present. There are patients who present who are completely asymptomatic, who are going in to have a routine surgery, and they do have a blood count done prior to that, that's abnormal. So that in all age groups, it's this, there's a real spectrum of symptoms that patients present with, and the severity can change of those symptoms over time. So what are we talking about as far as treatment options when it is finally diagnosed? Um, there are a number of possibilities. Um, some patients are, are treated with phlebotomy alone, which is we actually take out red blood cells on a periodic basis to try and maintain their hemoglobin at a certain level. Um, sometimes we use uh, medications where the point of the medication is just to decrease the red blood cell count or the platelet count or the white count. Um, with the discovery of the JAK2 mutation, there are medications which actually have been uh, approved by the FDA that target this JAK2 mutation, and it's really been uh, an incredible lifesaver for people who have terrible symptoms of their disease. It can alleviate symptoms very, very well. So there's lots of options um, for patients. Um, there are new options, of course, in development. And we're all excited to see uh, what will happen in the next few years as sort of the molecular revolution in biology continues. Uh, have you um, heard any talk about possible genetic treatments for this disease as um, research into genetic markers and things of that nature progresses? Uh, do you see any future in that progression? And where can our listeners go and get more information about PV? Well, for more information, I really recommend that they go to this excellent website, voicesofmpn.com, which will tell them a lot of information about their disease. I think in the world of cancer in general, not just rare cancers, this is a very exciting time because we are learning about uh, mutations in many genes that cooperate uh, to cause cancer. 
um, and we are developing targeted uh, medications to many of these mutations. At the same time, there's really a revolution in immunotherapy, uh, trying to marshal our own immune system um, to help fight uh, cancers. And I think both of these trajectories are going to be really important in the cure, hopefully, over time of myeloproliferative diseases and related hematologic malignancy. Well, I sure appreciate you talking with us today, Doctor. I'm happy to be here. Thank you for having me. Thank you. You've been listening to Health Professional Radio. I'm your host, Neil Howard, in studio with Dr. Ellen Ritchie. Associate Professor of Clinical Medicine at Cornell Medical College. And we've been talking about rare diseases as Rare Disease Day, February the 28th, fast approaches. Transcripts and audio of this program are available at healthprofessionalradio.com.au and also at hpr.fm. You can subscribe to this podcast on iTunes and listen in and download on SoundCloud.